In this video, I'm going to walk you through the exact steps you need to take to create beautiful jewelry that is well made and recognizable as your own and to gain the confidence in your skills to make it happen. I'm literally going to share my entire Savvy Artisan Blueprint with you, so make sure you tune in and pay attention. It has taken me 14 years to figure this out and perfect it, and I'm excited to share it with you. If you haven't watched the previous three videos, please make sure you do so as we talked about the savvy soldering method within that approach and more specifically learning what your torch can and cannot do, how to control it to make work easier. This is important so you will have better results more consistently reducing the amount of waste and botched pieces of your work. Let's take a step back and look at this from the savvy artisan approach where we will look at a piece entirely from the comprehensive perspective or as a whole from the beginning to the end of the creation process. When I first got started making jewelry, I jumped in with both feet and I never looked back. I was having fun making piece after piece and having a wonderful time, but I was also making a lot of mistakes and scrap piles. I didn't have a mentor or online classes where I could pop on and get feedback or ideas of things to try when I ran into certain pitfalls, and this is where the savvy artisan approach began. As I began to pay attention to my creation process, I noticed that there were several steps that were constant, and when I followed these steps, my results became more consistent and my contribution to the scrap piles became much fewer. First, you would need to consider a concept or idea, like as a whole. The one thing I challenge my students to do is to keep a sketchbook. Say, what? Ugh. That was a frightening thing for me, as I am not trained in any drawing skills. And if you happen to have drawing skills or natural talent, then you are already one step ahead of a lot of us. Now, if you are not artistically inclined in drawing skills like me, even rudimentary drawings or sketches are going to help in solidifying the idea for your design. Another thing you could do is find images that depict or inspire the idea of what you're after, so you can let nature or geometry inspire you. One other thing that I have found quite helpful is to make a paper model, especially if I have a very complex or involved piece. You will also need to take into consideration the materials you are using. Are you working with gold, silver, copper, brass, any other materials? It is important as each of these metals come with their own set of working conditions. For instance, gold is not conductive like silver and copper. It does not require the entire piece to be heated to temperature for the solder to flow. Rather, you would use a small pointed flame just in the immediate area of work to be done. As I stated, copper and silver are both conductive and require much more work to get your solder to flow. If you do not have the proper flame and enough heat, or maybe too much heat, you risk not having your solder flow, creating fire scale, or worse, melting the piece. While there are times that the piece can be salvaged, sometimes you just contribute to the scrap pile. Luckily, there are some telltale signs you can watch for to know what is going on with your metal. You would also need to consider if you were going to be including stones. How does that change your design considerations? How many stones are you going to be including? This is important because it may determine the order in which you do things in the construction process. I also find that it makes me more mindful of my connection points for the frame and the stone settings themselves. Once you have a design in mind, then you need to understand how to start to put each of those pieces together. This is important because you want to make certain that you pay attention to each piece, how they fit, not only within the design, but also their physical connection. The greater care you take right now during this process, the less time you are going to have to spend cleaning up a sloppy join or a connection later down the line. Next up is where your torch control really comes into play as you begin to build the framework of your piece. This part of the job is usually where people run into issues with their torch control or lack thereof, especially if the piece is more complex. You would need to consider the different types of torches available, and this is important because different torches have different capabilities. Not everyone is comfortable having a tank of gas in their studio, and due to insurance or housing rules, they may not even be allowed to have one. While acetylene and propane oxy torches will give you more control, 
there are other smaller butane torches that will allow you to achieve the same results. You just need to know what your torch can and what it cannot do. You would then need to understand how to control that torch. Torch control isn't just about not melting your piece, but it is also about not creating more work for yourself and avoiding uh, fire scale or accidental reticulation on the surface and other accidents like that. By developing good torch control, you will be more relaxed and confident that you can implement your designs without the additional worry of botching your design or botching your piece because you aren't sure of what is going to happen when you introduce the heat to your piece. Once you have your piece built, now it is time to set the stones. But there may be some other considerations for on your construction. For instance, if you are building a bracelet, do you form your bracelet before or after you set your stones? If the bracelet is formed first, how are you going to support your piece while setting the stone? Will the stone settings deform, making it impossible for you to set your stone? If you set the stone before forming the bracelet, are the settings going to change and possibly cause the stones to fall out and be loose or break? Some of these elements aren't as big of a concern on a small scale piece such as earrings or a pendant, but anytime you begin to get more three-dimensional shape, it is something that must be considered. Then of course there's the matter of how to set your stones. I have a few favorite tools I use now to make things quick and easy. Some are a little more expensive than others, but there are some that are tried and true and very inexpensive. Moving on. Now that our stones are set, the piece is formed and all but completed, it is time to do the finish and that can open up a whole other can of worms. I'm talking about polishing. Of course, everyone has their own way of doing things and the order in which you do the polishing is no exception. Some people like to polish before they set their stones and other people like to polish as the final step. Before you can put the final polish on your piece, you may have some cleaning up to do, especially if there are joins and connection points. You are going to want to make your piece as flawless as possible. And to add to that, there are only about a million different attachments for both the flex shaft or polishing arbor, micro motors, whatever. So do you know which ones to use and their proper order? And the final bit is what type of finish are you after? Perhaps you want to add a patina and have a matte finish, or maybe you're after that super high mirror finish. So as you can see, while the Savvy Artisan approach has some flexible points, it is fairly methodic, knowing that regardless of what you make, you are going to follow the same steps. Design and concept considerations, mapping out your piece, fabrication and construction, stone setting, and finally, your polishing. Now that seems simple enough, but there's a lot that goes into each of those steps. All of this and a lot more is covered in my upcoming Freeform Cuff Workshop. I will show you in detail how to control your torch with confidence and not contribute to the scrap piles, as well as ensure that you are comfortable with the technique to stretch your wings and to find your own unique style and voice in the pieces that you create. You can literally watch over my shoulders as I walk you through all of this, and you can just follow along and implement it step by step. So make sure you are on the lookout for when my Freeform Cuff Workshop launches, because this is quite honestly some of the best information I have ever released. And if that is something you are interested in, all you have to do is click the link under this video and put your name on the early bird wait list. Everyone on the early bird wait list will get access to the registration link the night before the program opens up to the public. So again, make sure you put your name and your email address on that wait list so I know you're interested. All you have to do is click the link below, enter your details, and your spot is reserved and you will get early access to the program. In the next video, I'm going to show you how I came to develop the Savvy Artisan approach and how it can work for you and what it has done for one of my students and even for myself. I will show you a few detailed examples and what you can expect to learn and accomplish when implementing my approach in your own working process. So stay tuned because you don't want to miss this next video. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next one.